This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. Memphis. It's known for blues, barbecue, and something else. Memphis is rough, man. For real. This city breeds hardcore killers. Like homeboys were killing homeboys, you know. We was knocking each other off. One gang shows no mercy, bathing these streets in blood. A lot of folks tried to call. It's a lot of folks didn't leave. LMG. LMG, love murdering gangsters. Cause on the Mississippi Delta, it's kill or be killed. It's like an imaginary story, but it ain't. It's a death story and a death trap. Tennessee, heart of the Bible Belt. It's got more churches than gas stations, and everybody has a recipe for the best barbecue in town. It draws thousands of tourists who flock to visit the birthplace of the blues and the home of Elvis Presley. Memphis is also one of the deadliest cities in the country. It was folks. Dead everywhere. Dead in the garbage can. Dead in the snow. Dead standing up on the wall. Just death. In 2007, according to the FBI, Memphis was the most violent city in the nation, with more than 1,200 violent crimes per 100,000 residents. The number one reason for the bloodbath, gangs. It's like every major city took all their gangs, put it in a toilet, flushed it, and they came out in Memphis. This city of 674,000 holds some 300 different sets of gangs. The most notorious of those, the LMGs, love murdering gangsters. attitude that they were above everybody else. It caused them to really have to back up their attitudes. We liked the attention. We drew attention. We did things our own, on our own, and we did things our way. The gang started in Lemoyne Gardens Housing Project. Located on the city's south side, the gang made it synonymous with murder. I done seen folks get shot all kinds of ways. One bullet, two bullets, three bullets, four bullets, five bullets, dead. It's like, like survival of the fittest. You know, just gotta watch your back. The LMGs also made the gardens extremely dangerous for outsiders who dared to enter the area. You come through there, you gotta know somebody. You don't know nobody? I'm telling you what's been happening to you. And that's for real. 28-year-old D'Angelo Bills grew up in the garden. My life at 12, man, was... It wasn't boring. You hear me? Back then, I loved it. Skipping school. Smoking weed. Shooting dice. Shooting guns in the air. It was crazy. His LMG crew calls him wild for good reason. He's been shot 17 times. I got holes everywhere in my body. You know what I'm saying? And I got them in, the, in direct places that will kill you. In the head, in the chest, in the heart, in the stomach, in the leg, in arteries. Wild has lost feeling in almost his entire body. You can see this part right here, numb. This the only feeling I got right here in my body. You hear me, right here. One shooting took place when Wilde was hanging on his front porch, and a group of strangers appeared on his block. I wasn't really paying them no attention. You know what I'm saying? Someone was just telling me to look. Boom, as soon as I looked, it hit me in my face. Wilde was shot in a hail of gunfire. One bullet lodged above his eye. I was trying to snatch this 
out. But it was stuck on my eye bone, though. You hear me? Wilde took off running as bullets chased him. One hitting him in the hand, another in the back. My back was hurting so bad because the bullet was on my spinal cord. To this day, Wilde doesn't know why the men went after him. It's just part of life in this project. I found more gun. What you expect? You hear me? I'm hated by a lot of people. LMG member Curtis Crump learned early on to tune out the gunfire in Lemoyne Gardens. If you're in the park playing basketball, a couple guys got to shooting on the drive. I just kept on playing basketball because it wasn't nothing new to me. As long as I ain't get shot, I'm all right. Curtis was raised to believe in God and the Bible but the lure of fast money trumped his religious upbringing. You see drugs, you see people with nice cars, you see different other females, and once I picked up on it, man, the church life couldn't tell me nothing, my mama couldn't tell me nothing. Curtis was only 10 when he joined the LMGs. He started as a lookout, then quickly moved into selling drugs. He soon gained notoriety in the garden. I was doing anything to get my name out there. That's Curtis. Oh, he from the God. Oh, he's straight. Don't f with him. If you f with him, he got a whole lot of on his team. Curtis had already been shot seven times by his 18th birthday. Got shot right there. Shot me right there. I got another bullet hole right there. One shooting almost cost him his life. In 1990, Curtis was playing craps and was up more than $3,000. The trouble started when another player didn't like the way the dice were rolling. Like, Curtis, give me something. I told him I ain't get nothing, man. I ain't go ask your hoe, give you something. Go rob a bank, do whatever. The other gangster went to his car and grabbed an Uzi, then began shooting at Curtis. I end up on the ground, and I see him run up on me. I told him, I'm going to blow your ass up, man. He might well gone kill me. But that one unloaded on me. The gunman fired more than 30 rounds, hitting Curtis in the legs five times. I might got to kill this now, you know what I'm saying? And you think, well, I don't want to do it because if I do, I'm going to jail. The shooter was added to a list of enemies, topped by the LMG's most hated rival, the Gangster Disciples. The two gangs have battled for control of the Memphis streets for years. It traces back to the LMG's most revered leader, George Hewlett, AKA G-Train. In 1993, 23-year-old G-Train ruled the drug scene in South Memphis with an arsenal of weapons and an iron fist. He was like Sammy to Sam. I mean, everywhere he went, he had two or three guns. To fellow gang members, G-Train was invincible and could not be brought down. He got shot. He's still out the next day. Run, run. He wasn't ever scared of nothing. He went anywhere he wanted to go. Alvin Johnson, known as Dog Pound, was G-Train's childhood friend. He had some, he had enemies. He had a lot of enemies. G-Train's biggest enemy was a local gangster disciple leader named Daryl Jordan a.k.a. Cowboy. It all started with the rumor that Cowboy had jumped the little brother of a high-ranking LMG member. Cowboy had robbed him. You know what I'm saying? Took it money, took it dope. So they disrespectful, you know what I'm saying? Cowboy was also disrespecting the LMGs by selling drugs on their turf. 
a crime punishable by death. A cowboy, Daryl Jordan, had uh, violated uh, the lines of demarcation. It was trains turf. There was no question about who ran that area of town. Cowboy was smoking weed with two friends in a parking lot near the Lemoyne Gardens project when six members of the LMGs, including G-Train, pulled into the lot. Train called Cowboy over to settle their differences. Minutes later, all hell broke loose. When the shooting stopped, Cowboy was lying near a parked car. He had been hit 12 times, including once in the head. The police rushed to the scene and found Cowboy amazingly still alive. He immediately made a gasping claim. When the officer got down and asked him what happened, what happened? Memphis, the River City. B.B. King mastered the blues here on Beale Street, and Elvis recorded his first album at the legendary Sun Studio. The city is also home to the LMGs, one of the most violent gangs in the South. People love to see evil. People liked it. Where I'm from, we feed off of, you know. The LMG's base of operations is Lemoyne Gardens Housing Project in South Memphis, one of the poorest areas in the city. The project has 842 apartments and was built as part of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal initiative. The goal was to rid Memphis of its slums by providing the poor with temporary housing. It was unsuccessful. Public housing became a permanent place for people who were in poverty to live, a place we could forget about people in many ways. Those forgotten people have gone through generation after generation of hopelessness. It concentrated substantial numbers of people in a relatively small area that have very little hope for economic advancement often have failing schools that are serving them, few services that are available to them. All of that starts giving rise to the kind of criminal activity we see. While many residents of the projects were hardworking citizens, some chose a different path. In the 60s and 70s, dealing drugs became a way to make a fast buck. The scene only got worse in the 80s when crack hit down. Once crack cocaine hit the streets of Memphis, Tennessee, uh, there was a great deal of fuel added to the fire. Gangs hit the streets. The project's toxic mix of poverty and drugs was irresistible to large gangs looking to expand their business. The gangster disciples of Chicago were one of those in search of a quick buck. Their arrival disturbed longtime residents like Alvin Johnson, a.k.a. Dog Pound. It came to a point where we were like, hold on, something is changing out here. Really changing. When we were growing up, we used to come out and play ball and stuff. We wasn't that much arguing or fighting or hearing gunshots or none of that. Then, over the time period, things started changing. When, probably when a lot of gangs started coming in, Memphis and stuff. The situation in Lemoyne Gardens was made worse by ongoing feuds with three other housing projects in South Memphis. They put all these four projects in one neighborhood. So you know you got four different, you got four project neighborhoods now. It's gonna be some fight. In the early 1980s, a group of friends from Lemoyne Gardens Project decided to band together. They called themselves the Lemoyne Gardens Mafia, LMG for short. There wasn't no way out. You hear me? This is all we know. We're going to ride together. Wherever we go, we're going to be together. You hear me? Whenever something happens, we're going together. 
That's just how we was. The LMGs were soon more than 100 strong, promising to have one another's backs. If somebody from the outside, we was in trouble with it, all of us was going. It wasn't no, I'm going to pick you, I'm going to pick you, I'm going to pick you, I'm going to pick you. No. It's like, man, look, man, you know we're in trouble with uh, such and such and such. Oh, for real? Hold up, man. Let me get everything. Let's go. When we mob, we mob deep. When we mob, everywhere we go, we gonna be, it's somebody gonna recognize who we are. The drug scene in South Memphis was exploding, and the LMGs were looking to dominate the trade. Come get anything over there in Lemoyne Garden, from marijuana to crack cocaine to powder cocaine. It was, it was really like a, a, a mini cartel. The gangs united front quickly became profitable. Guys over there, they stood together, they hustled together. This area right here is like where well, me, George, and a whole lot of us growed up at. We hung right up around this area right here. And uh, it was like a supermarket to us. Money everywhere, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? By 1993, the LMGs were running the streets and 23-year-old G-Train was rising to the top. Train always had money. Yeah, for real. He was a bona fide hustler. His name just blew up in the neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? Everybody want to be around Train. G-Train threatened anyone who got in his way as he assumed control of the LMGs. The name Train conveys a certain message. Her message is, and it's about fear, it's about violence, it's about a hardcore Memphis gang. His deadly mystique soon stamped him as untouchable. He went anywhere he wanted to go. He felt like he wanted to go there, that way he went. He wasn't running for nothing. G-Train used his drug profits to purchase a nightclub, the headquarters. It became the place to be seen and the main hangout for the LMGs. Normal night, we have probably about, that's about 500 people come up through here. Cars all up down here, all up here. From the street, it looked like a legitimate business. But behind closed doors, the headquarters held a secret. Club was more like no club slash, no trap house. Ecstasy pills, marijuana, cocaine. I mean, he's all there in the club. So it's like a one-stop shop. And this is where they would hold their meetings, or so-called roll calls. And they would talk about their business. They would talk about, OK, where are we at with our money? You know, how we're going to make money? What, what are the gangster disciples doing? What are the rival gangs doing? G-Train's empire continued to grow as he appeared to go legit. He formed a music group and cut a rap album. G-Train also tried to build a reputation as a local Robin Hood. He bought a barber shop, gave out free haircuts, and sponsored a 4th of July fireworks show. Oh, he showed love. I mean, on Christmas, if you, ain't, if you don't have one, he'll make it happen for you. I mean, he bring gifts. To the LMGs, he was a hero, a man to be emulated. He was really like a daddy to me because I ain't had my daddy. You hear me? And I was trying to be like this man, him. Like when Train started selling dope, I wanted to sell some dope. I seen Train buying cars, I gotta get me a car. I seen Train toting guns, I want to do that too. That's when he started taking the guns to school. G Train wasn't loved by all. As his power and wealth grew, he and the LMGs began crossing enemy lines. They were starting to sell drugs over onto the gangster disciple territory. And when that started happening, the LMGs and G-Train were starting to cut into the money of the gangster disciples, which is going to cause a problem. The gangster disciples wanted G-Train dead. It only added to his legend. He was said to have nine lives for all but 
times that people tried to kill him, uh, but were unsuccessful. The gangster disciples got frustrated when they couldn't get to G-Train and went after his family instead. In the early 90s, they attacked Train's brother and almost beat him to death. To the LMGs, the assault was a declaration of war. Train just took it out on them. He didn't care who it was. If he was GD, he was going to get it. All of us crazy. You hear me? But we cool crazy. We ain't crazy till you mess with us, till you do something. That... My brother, my cousin, my partner, my sister, my mama. The LMG's plan was simple. It was just SOS, shoot on sight. The murders began to pile up as each killing was met with another. God, we, it's Murderville, you know what I'm saying? So you get coming through there out the dog, it's bloodshed. The LMG's name took on a more sinister meaning. LMG changed from Lamont Garden Projects to love murdering gangsters. The posse had a new battle cry. GD, short for Gangster Disciples. LMG added a K to it, GDK, Gangster Disciple Killers. By 1996, corpses were piling up on the streets. It was unlike anything Memphis authorities had ever witnessed. The war by law enforcement standards was off the charts because of the number of killings and shootings that were taking place in a small period of time. The Memphis PD were outnumbered and overwhelmed. Even with 1,500 officers, they couldn't handle the nearly 2,000 arrest warrants generated by gang violence alone. But how are you going to chip away with that small of a, a population of officers? It's, it's virtually the numbers are impossible. It's like sticking your finger in a dam to keep from busting. You know, it's, it's, it's not going to work. Check, make sure there's one in the chamber. With gang violence reeling out of control, the sheriff's office responded by creating the Street Crimes Unit, a hand-picked team of some of the most specialized officers in the area. I liken it to a, pretty much an all-star team. You take people from different divisions and you bring their particular skill set and you add them together, and that's, that's the Street Crimes concept. The unit had their work cut out for them. The LMGs had the gangster disciples running scared, and the cops were playing catch-up. Memphis was in a stranglehold. I mean, everywhere you go, you seeing guys throwing up the air, saying, you know, LMG, LMG. We weren't going looking for trouble. Trouble always found us. It always found us, man. Bam, man, that's a lot of dead for nothing. For real. Memphis. From Graceland to the Civil Rights Movement, this city has seen its share of history, much of it infamous. Going on about your business now. Or some gonna rob, some gonna shoot you. In 1997, the Street Crimes Unit was formed to combat one of the city's greatest threats gangs, among them, the LMGs or love murdering gangsters. Detective David Ballard has been a member of the team for two years and has first-hand knowledge of the violence. His aunt was a sheriff's deputy and was killed by a gangster while on duty. Her call sign was Charlie Seven, and I got to put on my trigger finger there. Hopefully, in the event I ever have to use that finger, she'll be there and she'll help me make good decisions. Maybe like I got a guardian angel riding with me. The Street Crimes Unit has a tip on some gangbangers selling drugs out of a trap house in South Memphis, where the LMGs reign. This guy got some, uh, should have some crack cocaine, marijuana. You know, be aware there's gonna be some handguns in here. Y'all watch, you know, have some on the perimeter, yeah. We'll take out that glass door and he might you just make entry. You'll be on the shield, make your entry through there. Come 
one gang member was arrested. They can't kind of go hand in hand. There's, there's drugs, there's money, there's gang, and it's a criminal enterprise. The officers confiscate a weapon and a stockpile of drugs and cash. They have some kind of drug notes. This right here, this is uh, you know, $16,800. How he's got it split up. They have all kinds of little notes in here, how much they've made. This is powder cocaine. This is what people snort up their nose. It's probably going to be about a pound or two of marijuana here. This was found in that cabinet in the kitchen where he was at. Well, right by that cabinet door, this was loaded with four rounds. And check this gun, see if it's stolen. That'll be an additional charge. The street crimes unit is constantly on patrol in dangerous neighborhoods like Lemoyne Gardens. Oh, it's it's 11 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. You know, well, I mean, what are you out doing? Four or five guys just walking around. We'll pull up, check them, see if anybody's got any warrants. Just kind of talk to them, try to interact with them. And you never know, they may they may be receptive to talking to us, or they may take off running. They are looking for gang members. Or you in jail for? This afternoon, they find a group of vice lords. Question. Come here. Come here. I hate gang members so much that, you know, I don't care about the, the bandana. I'm going to get it and use it what it's for. It's probably pretty much like to wipe my shoes with. Mine, they're mine now. Yeah, how they do it. Yeah. You're not going to walk around in, in my presence with a, with a flag. They're going to represent one way or another when they're walking the streets, who, who they belong with. Love murdering gangsters, the LMGs, also represent with the color red. We wear the opposite colors, our disciples. You know, that, that street colors are blue, we wear red. There is no jump-in required to get into the LMGs. There's only one initiation rule. You've got to be from the Lemoyne Gardens Project. Oh, who's from the Lamont guy, we was hood, we growed up together, it was like a family thing. The love murdering gangsters don't have many rules. But there is a code that members like Curtis Crump adhere to. It's all about sex, money, and murder. We love having sex, we love getting money, and he up his murder. Tattoos also aren't mandated. But many members choose to mark themselves with the name of their hood. If you real thoroughbred that were born and raised from the guy, you got that, you know what I'm saying? You got this stamped on you. Oh, my tattoo, it was LMG soldier, you know what I'm saying? We got LMG on right there on my hand. It's basically my hood, you know, something I live by, die by. A lot of people don't like LMG, so just by me having this on my hand makes me in danger. The LMGs keep it simple when signing. We had a handshake like this. We throw each other like this. We throw the L. That's Lamont guy. I stand for the L, Lamont guy. That's the L sign. That's represent LMG. And there's no other sign. That's the only sign. Representing isn't just about showing your allegiance to the LMGs. Their leader, G Train, flipped the script and used it as a warfare tactic. When Train was on the hunt for gangster disciples, he would wear the blue colors of the LMG's rivals and ride the streets. His disguise as a GD had deadly repercussions. They find GDs and they throw their own sign at them when they throw it back. <laughs> they jump and out shoot. The LMG's use other methods to trap their rivals in the hood. They have been known to shoot out the streetlights in Lemoyne Gardens. If anything was to go down, any type of violence or any type of altercations, they wouldn't know how to get out. It's pitch dark. And you know, it's a lot of folks tried to come. It's a lot of folks didn't leave. The cover of darkness has another purpose, to keep away the police. They see a dog and we run through a cut and they see a dog, we know they're going to stop. In 1997, the LMGs were untouchable in Memphis. The war with the GDs had accelerated, and the cops couldn't control the bloodshed. 
then, a dead man told his tale. I ain't no such thing, uh, well, shoot this person, let him live, go to the hospital. Okay, he, go, he gonna come back. In some shape, form, or fashion, all we come back gets. Memphis, Tennessee. Love murdering gangsters, the LMGs, and their ruthless leader, George G. Train Hewlett, had decided it was time to kill or be killed. He's trying to send attention up in the media, you know? That's all they talk about. Gang leader this, gang leader George Hurley this, this and that. The LMGs were involved in a turf war with the gangster disciples and anyone else who threatened their drug business. Man, it was bad coming in that project, man. Yeah. It's like a death trap. I ain't no telling what line to happen when you come in there. G-Train's wrath was focused on a gangster disciple named Daryl Cowboy Jordan. Cowboy had robbed the brother of an LMG member and was dealing drugs in the gang's hood. G-Train decided two strikes were all it took. Cowboy was hanging in a parking lot when two cars filled with LMGs pulled up. George Hewlett was in one of those vehicles and called Cowboy over for a discussion. A couple of minutes after that conversation took place, there were multiple gunshots. When the firing stopped, G-Train walked away unharmed. Cowboy was lying near a parked car. He had been shot 12 times. The police arrived on the scene just in time to hear his final words. He had uh, kept telling the officers on the scene that uh, Train, Train was the one who shot him. Cowboy died minutes later. The authorities were confident that Cowboy's dying declaration would finally put G-Train away for good. Cowboy had no reason to lie. He knew that uh, he was probably about to expire and he wanted the officer to know who had done him in. The case was weak from the start, as eyewitnesses said they never saw a G-Train holding a weapon. Even the most damaging witnesses were only claiming that George was there at the scene, that he called Cowboy over to the vehicles, and that gunfire erupted shortly thereafter. Nobody could put a gun in George Hewlett's hand. The case fell apart, and G-Train walked free. And then they found him not guilty on the charge, you know? Wouldn't come like, he didn't have no pill. He was talking at that time. He never did nothing. The Memphis PD suspected the LMGs had intimidated witnesses. People kill, people tend to kill witnesses. If they just shot up this house, what's gonna stop them from shooting my house up? You know, what's gonna stop them from hitting my daughter or my son or my grandchild? No, I didn't see nothing, officer. Our motto, we can't leave no witnesses, so you might get caught up in the mix, you know what I'm saying? Two LMGs that were with Train pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter. They were sentenced to 10 years. G-Train was in the clear. The case marked a turning point in the prosecution of gangbangers in the city of Memphis. It was realized that there were some complexities to prosecuting gang murders and that they needed to put together a specialized task force to confront these kind of cases, dealing with witness intimidation, witness relocation, and certainly using gang members uh, as witnesses. The district attorney took action, creating the Gang and Narcotics Prosecution Unit. The sheriff's office also launched the Street Crimes Unit, an elite team of officers determined to end the bloodshed. It did nothing to slow down the LMG's reign of terror. If anything, G-Train's acquittal made him even more brazen. 1998. First, Train was suspected of shooting two gangster disciples from a moving car. Then, just weeks later, an officer responding to gunshots found G-Train standing over the dead body of a gangster disciple 
nicknamed Demetrius Jones. The officer then found himself in the line of fire. An officer went across the street to confront George, and at that time, George took a shot at him, and he jumped into his car and drove off, and the officer was pursued but lost him. Train was placed under investigation for the murder, but remained on the streets. And the LMG's battle with the gangster disciples was far from over. The violence became so rampant that Curtis Crump's girlfriend's house was shot up by a group of gangster disciples. With his girlfriend injured, Curtis was outraged. I just looked at it here. Man, you got me up, you know what I'm saying? You should have came at me instead of trying to go to my girl's house, you know what I'm saying? Oh, of course, that went on a rampage. Curtis and a fellow LMG decided to pay the shooters a visit. They rolled up to their house fully armed, then kicked in the door and started firing. We made sure we shot everybody in their house, you know what I'm saying? Let them know it, that I did, you know what I'm saying? Even if you was the one who shot in my girlfriend's house or not. Nobody was killed, but the point was made. Don't mess with the LMGs. We always thought we was untouchable. They can't kill us, man, you know what I'm saying? We untouchable, man. The LMGs may have been untouchable, but Lemoyne Garden's housing project was not. In 1998, the city began to redevelop South Memphis. The first order of business was the destruction of the garden. I hate to see they tore it down. I cried and took a couple of bricks with me. That's my stomach ground. I love that place. I was like, man, we got a lot of shit to deal with. Hell yeah, they tore the project down. What the hell we finna do now? You hear me? The garden was gone. But Memphis was faced with an unexpected consequence. The LMG spread throughout the city, and so did the bloodshed. Now, we was everywhere. And of course, we still got that my you mentality, you know what I'm saying? It's still LMG, you know what I'm saying? Well, we're going to get established over here or get established over there. G Train continued to dominate the LMGs, despite the attention of the Shelby County Gang Unit. Train, a lot of people feared him. He was not scared to pull the trigger based off the rumors on the street. He was feared, and he was very intimidating. I guess, you know, when, when you feel like you that king type person, you feel like you can't be touched. G-Train's legend was building, but even legends don't live forever. He was living like he had a death wish on him or he knew death would ride him. Memphis, Tennessee, 1999. The LMGs love murdering gangsters. We're as strong as ever. Despite the destruction of their hood, the Lemoyne Gardens Project. Their embattled leader, G-Train, had avoided serious jail time and numerous assassination attempts. A lot of gang members started to believe in uh, this uh, mystique that he was invincible. George had nine lives. On November 10th, G-Train's legend came to an abrupt end. The details are sketchy, but it's known that G-Train was alone at his nightclub, the headquarters. Train's childhood friend, Dog Pound, was locked up at the time, but word from the street reached him in jail. Train Trumpel Park right here, and he was coming out this door right here. So when Train entered out the door, we entered his car, two guys come running around with assault rifle, start shooting. Dogbound says Train was struck multiple times. He fled his truck and ran down the street, his shooters close on his heels. Well, he fell down there. And they said a man came, stood over, pulled out another gun, and shot him one more time in the neck. No witnesses came forward, 
and the case has never been solved. I don't call it murder. I call it assassination. He was assassinated. It's like he had found so many of him that you would never know who did it, you know? You got everybody coming at you. You got, you got too many people to watch. G-Train's nine lives were finally over. The gang was devastated. It affected me a whole lot. Really a whole lot. I miss him a whole lot. He was a friend to me. Close friend. I think about me every day. I started crying, man. I was baby crying. You know how a baby cry? I was baby crying, man. I ain't never cried like this, man. Hundreds of people attended G Train's funeral. It was like a celebrity had passed away. Like the Pope. <laughs> I mean, cars all as far as you can see. The Shelby County Gang Unit also attended, expecting retaliation. Snipers, detectives, homicides, CIAs, in the bushes, camouflaged. I ain't never seen no friend like that in my life. But we're all in bushes. Man, it was more police than The payback never came. Gang members say the LMGs have been in turmoil since G-Train's death, and they're keeping a low profile. When you cut off the head, you know, you, you shut down everything. And the whole body can't function. It was a reality check, you know what I'm saying? And like, damn, what we gonna do now? The land where Lemoyne Gardens housing project once stood is now covered with mixed income townhomes. Dog Pound is out of jail and says he's staying clear of trouble. When he visits his old haunts, he barely recognizes the area. This was the main spot right here. It's a whole lot different now. Whole lot of things have changed. Way different what, what, it, what it used to be. I miss a lot of it. I can't hang around like I used to. Get a trespass charge. <laughs> Some believe that because the LMGs are spread out across the entire city, they are more dangerous than ever. So you can be reached anywhere, anytime. And that's just, that's a fact of life right there. You're not, you're not safe anywhere in this town. 34-year-old Curtis Crump is currently on trial for attempted first-degree murder and aggravated assault. He's confident that the LMGs will soon be as large as when G-Train ruled the streets. We got brothers that came up and they throwing LMG up. Kids might be throwing LMG up, so it ain't gonna never end. Yeah, that train will definitely roll, you know what I'm saying? No matter what. D'Angelo Bills hasn't spent a full year outside of jail since 1990. Wild continues to represent the gang, but is aware it comes with a price. I lost a lot of love, man. A lot of friends. Man, a lot of n they ain't even here no more. You hear me? No half of them in penitentiary, like I said, and half of them dead. He hopes that his current stint in jail for a weapons charge will be his last. When he gets out, Wild plans to focus on his rap career, where he pays tribute to his fallen LMGs. I'm seeing tears, and can't nobody feel my pain. Over the years, I done seen some of the craziest thing. Remember Train? That's a legend. Most of y'all don't know. When he was here, he was ran like they pictured a ghost. Right after that, little daddy died. A chopper opened his chest. I wish like hell I could have caught him just to give him my vest. Life is a mess. You can only live once on earth. So if I die right now today, I know my mama be hurt. I'm still thinking about my auntie. Shout it, MPL, little Mike. They got me shedding tears, dog, but they're just life. They're just life, man. See it?